Good evening and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Kirthi Chigrupati. I'm a sophomore at the college studying government and computer science and I'm co-chair of the JFK Junior Forum Student Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the Park Street side and the JFK Street side of the Forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. We'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy for helping to bring together tonight's discussion. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Harvard College undergrad, Liv Sirio. Hello everyone, my name's Liv Sirio and I'm a first year at the college studying English and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome award-winning journalist Marty Barron and our incredible moderator, Nancy Gibbs. Nancy Gibbs is the director of the Shorenstein Center and the Edward R. Moreau Professor of Practice of Press, Politics, and Public Policy. That is a tongue twister. Additionally, Gibbs held the title of Editor-in-Chief at Time until 2018, covered four presidential campaigns during her tenure, and was the first woman to hold the position. Our speaker, Marty Barron, began his career as editor of the Brown and White Student Newspaper at his alma mater at Lehigh University. Following the conclusion of his education, Barron worked for many different news organizations across the country, though no most notably holding the position of editor at the Boston Globe, and most recently, the position of executive editor at the Washington Post. Along with his newsrooms, winning a total of 17 Pulitzer Prizes, the exceptional teams of journalists led by Barron broke stories in covering secret surveillance by the NSA, former President Donald Trump's notorious Access Hollywood tape, and the persistent problems of sexual abuse within the Catholic Church. Throughout all of his work, Marty Barron shows the power and necessity of journalism in starting crucial conversations and shedding light on difficult truths. Thank you again, Marty, for being one of my personal heroes, and I feel confident when speaking on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum when I say that we are honored to hear from you tonight. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Nancy Gibbs and Marty Barron. for joining us. Thank you, Marty, for coming home here to Boston. Um, for, for anyone here who is not immersed in the arguments that are roiling newsrooms and setting press critics' hair on fire, why do we, is it important that we devote a forum to the subject of objectivity in journalism? Isn't everyone all in on being fair and objective and truth-seeking? Uh, well, we're certainly not all in on the idea of objectivity. I think this has become a concept, uh, particularly in journalism, that's been, uh, has been a bit of a revolt against the, against the idea. Um, and so I have kind of made it a little bit of a cause of mine to try to shift the dialogue and, and maybe make the dialogue a bit more nuanced and, and, uh, uh, and help people understand where that, that concept came from. And, you know, the, the revolt is really based on the idea that the feeling that journalism has, uh, is insufficient to the times, uh, that uh, it's been, you know, difficult to hold uh, people accountable with this kind of journalism, that, um, that it has excluded uh, uh, people in marginalized communities, uh, that uh, it has, that it amounts to false equivalence and false balance and both sidesism and uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, journalism. Um, and um, that's not what it is. Uh, that's not the origin of the concept. Uh, and that's not how it really ought to be practiced. Uh, and that's not what I mean by it. So, so that's why I've, about, I've started talking about it. Talk a little about, about what you mean. Because I do feel like every time this topic comes up, we're, we get into this, these weird semantic rabbit holes of like, you know, I don't know anyone who's arguing that if you're writing a story about how the earth is round, you need to give equal time to its no. flatness. So no. there are a lot of straw men in this debate. Thankfully. So what are you talking about when, or what is the misunderstanding, do you think, around the objectivity question? Well, as I said, I think people uh, see it as false equivalence and false balance. Uh, and that here we have these controversial subjects in our time, uh, and particularly instances where something is verified, something else is not verified, and 
there's the suggestion somehow that we're supposed to treat those equally. That's not what, that's not what objectivity actually calls for. And um, that wasn't the original concept going back 100 years. Uh, and it shouldn't be the concept today. And I don't think that it actually is. Uh, so, um, you know, I mean, I do, I do think that there are uh, people who kind of think they know the answers to their stories before they've embarked on the reporting. Uh, and uh, I think that's a problem uh, for our profession. Um, and uh, that I think that we do need to keep an open mind, that we need to go into stories with an open mind, with a recognition that, is, that we don't know everything. In fact, we don't know all that much. And we may not even know what we think we know. Uh, the reality is that you know, when we start as journalists, uh, we're often looking at the world through a keyhole. Um, sometimes we can crack the door a bit more open and we can see more of what's going on. Uh, and when we're if we're lucky and skillful, we can swing the door wide open and see the entirety of the story uh, and be able to tell everything. But you know, I think we have to have some humility about what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and so, you know, uh, so the idea of objectivity, which goes back a hundred years, popularized about a hundred years ago by Walter Lippmann and some others, um, argues for a different, you know, for a different approach. So it's hard for me to imagine a good faith argument against keeping an open mind, pursuing the truth wherever it takes you. Like those all seem pretty non-controversial principles for a journalist to follow. And yet this is anything but a non-controversial topic, even leaving aside the, the misunderstanding of what objectivity looks like. Is part of the issue that if your reporting takes you someplace or uncovers something that you think that the reporter thinks might hurt one side of the debate or another, is that where then the problem comes in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I think that people see us in, in, in really perilous times where so much is at risk in our society today. Um, at, at the, from the start, democracy itself, um, truth uh, being at, in, in peril. Um, tolerance for, for all, and acceptance of all, all people, regardless of their race, ethnicity, identity, what have you. Um, people feel that that's at risk. Free expression being at risk, free press being at risk, basic civility, the basic norms of a democratic society, all of that being at risk. And the feeling is that the old standards, the old ways that we've approached journalism have been insufficient to the times, that they haven't done the job, that they haven't held uh, people accountable for uh, for undermining democracy, for promoting um, uh, uncivil, dis incivil discourse, uh, for all of that. And so, um, so this feeling is that traditional standards of journalism simply haven't worked and that we just need to reinvent uh, and reinvent journalism and that the old standards really should be abandoned because they haven't, they haven't served us sufficiently well. So one of the phrases that comes up often in this, in this debate from a former uh, employee of yours is around moral clarity, that the, the guiding principle shouldn't be objectivity, it should be moral clarity. Can you help us understand what that vision of that argument, that vision of the journalistic mission? Well, you should ask him, uh, but uh, I'm not the one to speak up for that, frankly. Um, I mean, I think there's a view that, look, we know what's right, we know what's wrong, uh, we know what's proper behavior, what's wrong behavior. Uh, we have to stand for democracy. We have to be opposed to the people who are, who are undermining democracy. We have to stand against violence, of course, uh, all of that. And I don't, I don't have any objection to those core principles, by the way. So I'm, I'm, uh, I agree, we should support democracy. We should support acceptance of all people. We should be opposed to violence. We should be in favor of uh, free expression. We should be in favor of a free press. We should be in favor of uh, uh, observing norms of civic discourse. But um, um, I have a problem with the concept of moral clarity, because whose moral clarity are we talking about? Uh, when it comes to the most contentious issues in our society today, um, who's more clarity? Uh, so you take the issue of abortion. Okay, I have my own opinions on that, of course, um, and other people do as well. Uh, their opinions may not be mine. Uh, so one side will say that, well, this is an issue of a woman controlling her own body. She has a right, absolute right, it's a human rights issue to control her own body. Somebody else will say, this is a life. Um, and um, this is a life, and that, that uh, you know uh, that uh, that life needs to be respected uh, and protected, and um, and both sides feel they're speaking with moral authority and moral clarity. Uh, so, whose moral clarity are we talking about? Take the Middle East today. 
a lot, both sides feel, you know, different sides feel they have moral clarity about their, their positions. You take any of the most contentious issues in society today and people will say, uh, you know, we'll speak with moral clarity. So who are we uh, in the press? We're supposed to pick a side? That's what people want us to do. Um, and so when somebody says moral clarity, I say, well, whose moral clarity are you talking about? And who's had moral clarity over, over the course of history? The Crusaders thought they had moral clarity, for God's sakes. Um, and, and they were invoking God uh, in, what, in what they were doing. And people throughout history have cited, have cited you know, their moral clarity and moral authority to do this or that. And we in the press, I don't think should be the, maybe on the opinion pages, somebody, and certainly on the opinion pages, somebody can say, this is how I feel, this is what is right, this is wrong. Uh, but in news coverage, which is what I've been responsible for over the years, um, we're supposed to cover the entirety of society and these different points of view and, and uh, allow people to uh, share their perspectives. So I'm glad you brought up the distinction because I think we should be clear that that what we're talking about is the kind of traditional news reporting as opposed to um, opinion journalism. Opinion journalism, but the the intense debate that uh, was launched by one of our fellows that we've talked about before, um, who longtime war correspondent for the AP and a very serious hard news reporter, um, challenged us to think about. Uh, it's not the job of the press to save democracy. And that had a lot of people think, but wait a minute, of course, of course it is. And the argument that she made was if you believe that a healthy society needs a strong independent press in order to succeed, which we do, then anything that undermines the strength and trust in the press is harmful to democracy. And if reporters think that it's their job to save democracy, it's gonna have the effect of reducing trust in the press and reducing, therefore, the health of democracy. That people think if you have an agenda as a reporter of anything other than finding out what's true, if your actual agenda is, my agenda is to save democracy, that that can be harmful. So how do you Yeah, well, I don't buy that. Uh, that so I, that, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go that far, and I don't even really understand the logic there. Uh, so to be honest with you, so uh, for, that, for that argument. The reality is that, um, look, in order to have a free and independent press, we have to have a democracy. We're not going to have a free and independent press unless we have a democracy. And, and by the way, we're not gonna have a democracy unless we have a free and independent press. They are inseparable. Uh, so I think there are core values in our profession that we should adhere to and that we should uh, that we should advocate for. We should advocate for a free and independent press. We should advocate for democracy because without one, we're not gonna have free expression in this country and we're not gonna have a free and independent press. We're not gonna have a lot of other things. Uh, we, should, we should be opposed to violence. We should be opposed to abuses of power. We should be uh, in favor of acceptance of all, all people. Uh, we should be in favor of the idea that people should have you know, abundant opportunity to achieve what they want for themselves and their families. So I do believe that there are core values in journalism that we, uh, that we should stand for. I don't think that we are a valueless profession. Um, so, but, you know, when you get to other issues, sort of broader issues that are public policy issues, uh, broader public policy issues, um, uh, then that's where, I, that's where I have a problem, is that I don't think that it's our job as reporters uh, or as journalists who are covering the news, to take a position on what should the what should the the country's policy be with regard to abortion? What should the country's policy be with regard to the Middle East? That's for the editorial page. That's for the opinion pages. Uh, we're supposed to cover all people and reflect their uh, their points of view. So, what do you think? And there are a lot of lines of this, but has contributed most to the accelerating decline of trust in the mainstream press. And yes, it goes back 40 years, but obviously it, it, it has reached a particularly perilous spot. So what is driving that? Well, uh, pr probably a variety of factors, but I think the, uh, well, starting with the proliferation of cable channels, uh, I think that contributed to it. I mean, look, in this country, we used to have just three major networks, right? Uh, we had, um, uh, we didn't have a national newspaper. We did have some national magazines. You had one, Time Magazine. Uh, we had Newsweek and maybe U.S. News and World Report, and that's it. 
Uh, and then, you know, in each community there was a local newspaper, uh, and then you watch the local, there were a couple of local news channels, and that's it. Uh, now there was proliferation of cable channel, of, of, uh, we have more cable networks, uh, particularly the introduction of Fox, uh, and then you have the internet. Uh, and the internet became accessible to everybody. And so now anybody can find um, a point of view or a set of so-called facts that reinforces their view of the world. Uh, they're not truly facts, but they're presented as facts. And, um, and so uh, that has led, people are saying, well, why isn't the media covering this? Why doesn't the media have this? It just, it merely stokes and foments suspicions um, and conspiracy theories, and many of these things are spread as conspiracy theories. How is it that, an, you know, uh, an Alex Jones, not the former Alex Jones of Harvard, the other Alex Jones, um, who, um, you know, uh, spread the conspiracy theory that the families of the kids who were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School, uh, that they were, they were actors, that they were engaging in a hoax, uh, that it was a false flag operation. How is it that people believe that? Uh, because, well, he has a show, uh, people can watch it. Uh, he has access, he has, you know, it's available on the internet. And people who are inclined to believe that or inclined to believe those kinds of conspiracy theories will believe it. And we've had a long history of conspiracy thinking in this country. I mean, this is not a, a, new, a new thing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Richard Hofstetter wrote the book, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And, you know, at the time of fluoridation of the water supply, there were people who said that was a communist conspiracy, and you can practically draw a straight line between that and concerns about vaccines today that they make you sterile or make you magnetic. So um, that's, we've had that kind of thinking in this country for a really long time. But it couldn't reach the audience at the speed and scale that it does? That's right. So, I mean, in, an, in wish casting maybe, but given the incredible proliferation of, of information, wouldn't you imagine that that would increase the value of reliable, trustworthy, verifying sources like the Washington Post or whatever, that exactly when people know that they're being bombarded by garbage information that they would rely and trust all the more on institutions that are actually putting in the work of verification, and yet it feels like the opposite is happening? Yeah, well, they uh, don't know they're being bombarded with uh, phony information. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, look, when <clears throat> keep in mind, when, when Steve Bannon, well, when Trump took office, Steve Bannon said that, he first of all, he described the media as the opposition party. Mm -hmm. And then he said the way to deal with the media is to flood the zone with shit. Um, and, well, the zone has been pretty well flooded with shit. And um, so uh, it worked. It works, and um, so there's a lot of stuff out there that's just completely untrue, totally unhinged from reality, and, uh, and yet people believe it. Do they know that they're reading stuff and believing stuff that's unhinged from reality? No, because it reinforces their view of how the world works. Uh, so uh, it, has, it should increase the value of verified information, of the, of the work that's been done by you know, institutions that actually have reporters that are going out and talking to people and looking at the evidence and presenting all of that in a, in a coherent way to the public, uh, but, it, but it hasn't had that effect. Do you, I mean, bring back... And, and on top of that, you have, I mean, I would say that polarization, for example, has become a business model. It's become a business model for politicians, and it's become a business model for a lot of, I wouldn't call news outlets, but media outlets out there. Well, so, you know, which brings up the painful point of the collapse of the business model for a lot of the, what we think of as the traditional press. Um, if I read the phrase extinction level event one more time <coughs> this winter, but the, at a time when the advertising model has collapsed and newspapers and news organizations are relying much more on their readers for revenue, doesn't that run the risk that you, you need to please your reader, you can't afford to alienate them, you need to, like how do you navigate the, that um, incentive to optimize for engagement with your reader and give them what they want and feed whatever those biases are in this? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, look, I mean, uh, when we were so dependent on advertisers, people said we were just trying to do the bidding of advertisers, right. then we became dependent on readers, and they said, you're just trying to pander to your readers. We can never, you know, it's like it can never win. Um, and, uh, I mean, and, and the reality is that before the internet, I mean, when the internet came along, most news outlets weren't charging at all uh, for reading on the, online. 
Uh, but keep in mind, before that, when we were just printing a physical newspaper, for example, people actually had to pay for it, right? They had to put a coin in the box or they had to pay a subscription. So for a script subscription to get it delivered to their homes. We weren't giving it away for free. Although um, if you think about it, it was an incredible bargain. It was a, it was a great bargain and, we, and frankly, we got the public too accustomed to getting it for almost nothing uh, because we had so, so much of advertising was paying the bill. Uh, so I don't know that, um, I mean, yes, uh, there are some news outlets that will pander to their audience in order to just get more people to, to step up and pay for it. Uh, but there are others that I think they see their value as being truly independent. And I think there is value in being truly independent. Maybe that's an act of faith uh, or an expression of faith on my part. Uh, but I do believe that there are a good portion of the American public wants uh, news outlets, reputable news outlets to go out, find the facts, do a really good job, go into it open mind, do objective reporting, be open minded, uh, um, fair, honest, honorable, rigorous, comprehensive, thorough, do that job, and then when they've discovered what those facts are, tell people what they've found. I mean, I, 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 um, I very much uh, liked what Sebastian Younger, the author of The Perfect Storm, wrote recently, uh, which is that, um, you know, about what a genuine journalist is. He said a genuine journalist is someone who's willing to destroy his own opinion with fact. Um, and he also said that a genuine journalist is someone who's focused on, um, on reality, not on outcome. Um, and so, and one of the examples that he gave was the press's coverage of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And that we, you know, that was a fiasco. Um, and, um, and it's something that would hurt Biden. Uh, but you needed to cover it for what it was, uh, the reality, regardless of what the outcome might be. Do you, um, when you think about how, frankly, expensive it is to do that, to put reporters in the field, to cover dangerous stories and regions of the world, to um, invest those time and resources, what's the risk that, that people who are able and willing to pay for high quality information can, and those who aren't able or aren't inclined, that we have, a, we have the risk of a real information divide opening up even wider at just the time that we can least afford that? Uh, I don't buy that argument. Okay, um, so uh, the reason I don't buy that argument is, we've always, as I said before, we've always charged for what we did. Nobody even made that argument when we were charging for a newspaper. Uh, they didn't say, oh my god, we've got an information, information divide. You should give out these newspapers for free. Um, it cost you a lot of money to, to print it. It cost you a lot of money to gather the news. Uh, but because we've got an information divide, you should just hand out this newspaper for free. Now, in the internet age, people say, oh my god, this, you're going to charge for this, and you, you should hand it out for free. I don't think that makes sense. Uh, first of all, I, I think that we should be paid for our work, because everybody should be paid for their work, and we have bills to pay, like the reporters' salaries and a lot of other people's salaries. And uh, why should we be the only uh, institution that actually, our company, why should we be the only companies that give away their work for free? Nobody else does that, you know? So I didn't notice, uh, you know, uh, Purell giving out its, its, its products for free during the pandemic just because people needed to, you know, keep their hands clean. So nobody gave their, away their work for free. Uh, so um, in, in addition, I mean, I think that, um, it's not that expensive, <laughs> that's the thing. When somebody, I remember when, when I was at the Boston Globe and we introduced for the first time our pay model and we had a class of interns that summer and uh, I always met with our interns right at the beginning and somebody said, well, this seems like a really good idea but you know, students like us, we can't afford a subscription. And I said, oh really, is that true? And they said, yeah, that's true. And I said, well, how much do you spend on beer every week? Um, how much do you spend, low a low blow, and I said, how much do you spend on your Starbucks coffees every week? And they all laughed nervously. And I said, it's not that you can't afford it, it's that you choose to spend your money on something else. Why don't you spend your money on news? Um, and um, it's not that expensive. I mean, you know, the cost of an introductory subscription to the Washington Post is like de minimis, really. Uh, and often for the New York Times as well. And so, um, 
I, it's just not that expensive in comparison to all the other things that are out there, what people are spending money on. For a bottle of water, for God's sakes. I mean, buy a bottle of water, and, and I've been running around the country talking about the book. I mean, in the airport, it's like $4.50 for a bottle of water, for God's sake. Not even smart water, you know, <laughs> which in, probably no one should ever pay for. So um, it's, it's, um, it's, I mean, then people will spend money on that. So why is, has there needed to be this enormous philanthropic um, consortium assembled to try to save journalism, particularly local? And I grant that the, that the economics of local journalism are even more dire than broader. But I'm curious about your thoughts about the pros and cons of, of big philanthropy coming in to try to address this challenge. Well, I think if there's a gap in the market, the, you know, philanthropic institutions can try to help fill it. I'm on the board of the Knight Foundation, which is the biggest supporter of uh, journalism in this country and has been since I can remember. Um, and so I, I believe in that. I mean, look, nobody likes, there's never been a model for journalism that anybody has ever liked, okay? So never once, okay? So when I got into the business, I started working for Knight Ritter, which was a big chain, publicly held, um, and they were making, what, 40 to 50% profits every year. And, uh, and when the industry got into trouble, they would do everything they could to make sure their stock continued to go up and that they continued to be able to pay their dividends. And the big complaint was that these publicly held companies are very short-term oriented. They're only focused on the quarter, quarterly performance. And uh, they are sacrificing investment in the newsroom in order to make the stock go up. So we don't like publicly held companies. Then you get people, then you get really wealthy people like Jeff Bezos or Patrick Soon Chong in, in, in LA or um, other people like that uh, buying uh, news organizations and they say, oh, this, you know, they have tr tremendous commercial interest. There are huge conflicts of interest in covering them. Uh, that's a huge problem. Uh, we've got to be concerned about that. Then you move to uh, private equity and hedge funds, uh, which are buying news organizations. And, uh, you know, that's like the worst because they treat uh, local news organizations like uh, annuities and they're extracting every little every last nickel out of them, uh, and then they don't care about the long-term future of those, those local news organizations. Then you get around, then it says, okay, nonprofit. That's, maybe that's the answer. I mean, actually, when I was at the Globe and we, uh, we had a really bad year in 2009, and I remember one uh, reporter coming in to me and saying, well, wouldn't it be better if we were a nonprofit? I said, we are. <laughs> That's not our solution, that's our problem. Um, so, I mean, nonprofits, first of all, still have to pay the bills, right? They have to earn enough money to pay the bills. So if you go, if you, if you don't, can't pay the bills by just people in your community donating to you, which is often the case, there aren't enough who will do that, then you have to go to, to foundations or you go to rich, another, another wealthy people in your community who have conflicts, right? Or foundations that are trying to press a cause uh, and they wanna see journalism that's gonna advance their cause. That's why those foundations exist. And by the way, who, who sits on the boards of all these foundations? Wealthy, the wealthy elite. Uh, you know, I don't know that I fall into either category, but um, um, you know, they, uh, they're the ones who are really on these foundation boards. And so you're right back in the same, so which one works? Which one, there is no, the, the so whole thing is one, that. We left one out, which is um, public media. And, yeah, public media, yeah. And whether you ever envision well, that playing a bigger role in this country as it does in others, or is that just well, not a thing that's first ever. First of all, public you know, media is supported by, through philanthropy. Uh, okay, it's not entirely supported through government. So it's called public media, but it's not entirely public. So, um, so uh, do I think, first of all, the government's not gonna be able to sustain the entire news ecosystem in this country, nor do I believe that taxpayers are willing uh, to have their taxes go to support the media, uh, nor do we, have we even, are we at the point where we can define what a news or a news organization really is, who's a news organization? And, or we haven't really, do we, we don't have a great definition of who's a journalist, and um, we got real problems there. Um, so uh, it's not that something can't be done. There are efforts in a variety of places, including in California, to try to provide support, but they're gonna have to go through those definitional issues. 
But for the most part, I don't believe the public is willing to see their tax dollars going in a substantial, in a, in a, and to a greater degree, to supporting uh, news organizations. And by the way, if they're dependent, if you're dependent on the government, all right, then what happens when the government changes and the government expects something in return? The, the president of the United States, for example. All you need to do is look at what happened to Voice of America during the Trump administration. He fired the entire uh, uh, leadership of Voice of America, which was independent. He, they, the, the new leadership of Voice of America then fired a huge number of people on the staff, and it was intended to be an, a news outlet that would be supportive of Donald Trump. And is that a good way to go? I don't think so. Why is it? Um that nine years after he came down the escalator in Trump Tower to announce that he was running, do you think that reporters are still arguing so fiercely about how to cover him? Uh, they're still arguing because he's a candidate. Um, and, and they're a little surprised that he's still around as a candidate um, in the, way that, the same way that they were surprised that he became a candidate in the first place in 2015. So, um, I think that's, uh, they're like, well, uh, obviously the coverage hasn't worked. He supposedly he shouldn't be here given that he lies consistently, given that he has, uh, he's proposing authoritarian measures, uh, given that he has violated every norm of civic discourse, that he treats people uh, abhorrently. Uh, and well, guess what? Here he is. And by the way, he has more support now. Uh, than before. How's that possible? So I think a lot of journalists are thinking, well, we haven't done our job. If we had done our job better, he wouldn't be there. I think that's, um, I don't think that's quite right, by the way. I don't think that thinking is right. Uh, but that is the reaction, I think, among a number of journalists. Do you find that, do you ever think that some of the framing about what the press has, has or hasn't accomplished or failed to do or succeeded in doing gives the press way more power than it actually has. Yeah, I think the, I think a lot. Both the press and the public think the press has a lot more power than it actually does. I mean, when you look at it, um, what about Amer I think only eight, eight percent or so of the American adult Americans actually list the New York Times as their primary as a primary source of news. Three percent for the Washington Post, something like that. I mean, how much impact is that going to have? Look at the total audiences for the cable networks. It's not that big. Uh, so people get their information from all sorts of sources that, uh, for some reason, haven't registered with many of us in the press. They get it from their pastors, they get it from their friends, they get it through, obviously, through social media, from people they don't even know. They don't even know what the source is, who's behind that, that source. They get it from a whole variety of, a whole variety of places. Um, and, and not all of the American public is actually paying that much attention to the news anyway. No, actually, actively avoiding is the... Well, a lot of doctors are recommending that these days as a way of reducing anxiety. So, so one of the things that we talk a lot about at Shorenstein right now, and you talked, you brought up the polarization of the public and how we even address the kinds of problems that we work on at this school around climate, around education, around criminal justice, income inequality. How do we even advance solutions to problems if we're not even able to have a single conversation or agree on a basic set of facts. This notion of sort of epistemic closure that we don't have access to even engage with large parts of the public. What responsibility does that put on, on newsrooms to try to close that gap? Well, I think we do bear a lot of responsibility. It's, by the way, the problem's worse than you described. It's not that we just don't agree on a common set of facts. It's, uh, it's that we can't even agree on how to establish that something is a fact. What does it take? What are the elements necessary to establish that something is a fact? I mean, we have, society is so devalued, the things that we've relied upon, you know, education, experience, uh, expertise, and evidence. <laughs> those are all the things that have been devalued uh, one after the next. Uh, uh, and those are the things that we've used to establish that something is a, is a fact. And so, you know, I mean, we do, we have a responsibility uh, and um, it's hard, it's, it's very hard to do when people are systematically trying to um, sort of poison the well, essentially, the informational well. 
Um, I mean, look, uh, Donald Trump, before he took office, after he was elected, before he took office, he was asked um, by Leslie Stahl, uh, why do you keep saying things, these things about the press? Why do you keep demonizing the press? And he said, I do, I do it so that when you publish something uh, that I don't like, that people won't believe you. He's totally open about it. And guess what? He succeeded. Um, uh, he's had tremendous success, and he's called that one of the greatest successes of his time in office, um, is that, that, he, that he undermined credibility and confidence in the press. And that's what he wants to do. That's what he'll continue to do. He'll do it even more so if he's back in the White House. So um, we do have a responsibility to, to work at that, but it's really, I think it's very hard to do. Um, I think, first of all, we have to, the public has to have confidence that we understand their lives. Uh, that we're writing about them in a way that shows that we know what they're living through, setting aside politics. I mean, what, what, you know, look, I mean, there's so many people in this country, in all communities, who are struggling in so many different ways. I mean, they're working at jobs that pay them a lot less than they had before, than, than the jobs they had before. Um, they may have a harder time even getting jobs. Uh, their kids uh, may not be able to stay in those communities because there are no jobs for them to have, so they're leaving. Um, there are all sorts of societal problems as a result of that, uh, and they, uh, you know, they despair, uh, or they feel like they're just struggling with so many things, currently struggling with the cost of everything, just the mere cost of living. And so we need to write about that. We need to understand people. We need to really get out and talk to people. I mean, I, uh, when people have asked me about like the 2016 election and how did we cover that, uh, where, where, where did we succeed, where did we fail? I say that our biggest failure was before Trump ever declared um, for the presidency. Um, and our failure was to anticipate that there would be a candidate like Donald Trump, there could be a candidate like Donald Trump. Because, um, and the reason is because we didn't understand the country well enough. We didn't get out into the country and talk to enough people in enough communities to understand the level of grievance, the level of uh, resentment, the feeling that uh, so many people, that they, they felt they were held in contempt, they felt they were being condescended to, they felt that the elites, and including and especially the press, um, didn't care about them. Um, and, um, and so we didn't do our job. Uh, and we didn't, it certainly didn't do it well enough to understand that this could lead to a, a candidate like Donald Trump. Who was the press focusing on at the time as the, as the so-called front runner? Jeb. Jeb Bush, you know, Jeb. Um, and, and, uh, and of course, there was, it's, it was exactly the opposite. It's exactly what, the, what uh, Republicans didn't want. They didn't want the Bush family. They didn't want the Clinton family. They didn't want the establishment, the, the elites. They wanted, they wanted to overturn all that. They wanted somebody who was gonna go punch the elites in the face. And how, could we, how, how do we miss that? We should be asking ourselves about that. Are we doing an adequate job today of really understanding why the American public thinks, the, much of the American public thinks the way it does? So many people I hear today say, gee, I, can't, I just can't figure out how anybody could possibly uh, uh, support Donald Trump. Well, maybe we should go find out why they do. We should dedicate ourselves to finding out why they do. And yet, you know, you've seen, I'm sure, the, the critique when the news organizations that even have the resources to try to send teams out to do that reporting, that then it gets ridiculed as, oh, those are diner safaris. And you can't parachute into Chillicothe and talk to some people and come back and report about it. What is the... What is the, the responsible, effective way of taking that temperature as opposed to the one that is you know, often caricatured? As yeah, and I think that is a caricature of what actually happens. So the first way to avoid that is just don't go into a diner, go somewhere else. Uh, but the, but I, I think the, um, look, there is a lot of good reporting. I mean, um, Eli Saslow, for example, who was a reporter for many years at the Washington Post and uh, moved to the New York Times, just does, um, he's an observer. He's, he spends, he doesn't parachute, he spends an enormous amount of time in, in communities and, and really tries to understand the fissures in American society. He did a terrific piece for the New York Times relatively recently about, uh, and it dealt with the issue of homelessness and all of that. And it was basically through the perspective of a, like a owner of a sandwich shop in a place where now all of a sudden on the street there were like homeless encampments. And, um, and the guy's business was going into the toilet. Nobody's coming anymore. 
And he didn't judge anybody. There's a really terrific interview that they did with him. He doesn't judge, he observes, and he describes. Uh, and you could see the frustration. And, and this shop owner is not condemning people who are on the streets, who are living on the streets. He's just saying, my, all of my, my entire life savings was invested in this shop, and now I'm losing it all. And it helps you understand, okay? I don't think the word, I don't think the name Donald Trump entered that, that, that story, and it didn't need to. But it does help you understand, like, okay, why are people reacting the way they are? Why are they concerned? What is it? What's going through their head? And it also under, helps you understand the, the life of a small shop owner, which we don't write about enough. Um, and, and so that's the kind of reporting, that's deep reporting, um, and we ought to do more of that. And, um, and we shouldn't be afraid of the subject matter either. And so, because if we truly want to understand America, then let's cover the entirety of America. And uh, let's understand where people's feelings come from. What is their origin? What are the roots of those feelings? And um, so, you know, I would love to, um, as I've told Eli, I would like to, I wish I could have just cloned you, you know, and, and put you all over um, because there's a lot, of, you know, we also, we had other uh, great reporters like that, Stephanie McCrumman, who's now at The Atlantic, and uh, who did that kind of reporting, and, and uh, we need more of that. That's not parachuting in. It's not, car it's not, a, it's not a caricature of anybody. Uh, it's spending time and listening, listening, actually listening to them. It's sort of deep listening. Um, and, and, um, and, and then fairly and accurately and sensitively portraying their uh, people's lives without passing judgment on them. I could add those, that kind of reporting also goes a long way to restoring trust. Well, that's what the point that I, that's kind of the point I was making is that people need to see that we understand them, that they that that we know what their lives are like. It doesn't, these stories don't have to do with anything with politics; they just have to do with how what life is like. And um, and so when you do those stories, people say, "Okay, well, that news organization they spend a lot of time in these communities. That's a community like mine, um, and they know where I'm coming from." And so then, when you deal with the more highly charged issues, they're more likely. Not always certain. Not it's not a certainty, but more likely to have confidence that you're telling the truth. Um, I want to open this up to your questions, and so as you know, we have four microphones, and I invite you to make your way to them. Um, oh my God! Take your time. It's okay. Don't fall. <laughs> I don't want to be held responsible for any injuries. Uh, so please. And introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and. Sure. Hi, my name is Kara. I'm in the Master's of Public Administration program at the Kennedy School, um, and I'm also a physician. And I'm wondering, um, there's a lot of pretty egregious things that kind of we see behind the scenes in some of the specialized um, healthcare settings. And I've often had the thought of like, I should really be talking to somebody, or you know, I can't necessarily do this neutrally. But is there an allyship that I should be forging with somebody who can look into some of these kind of topics that really we only see because we're there? Um, so I'm just curious what your recommendations are on like how to go about that in like an ethical way um, and maintain kind of credibility in our professions, but also maybe ally with some of the investigative reporting mechanisms or maybe go elsewhere with those stories. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you have to judge the ethics of your own profession in terms of what you're permitted to do. I can't really comment on that. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's been some really fabulous reporting from within hospitals, from within medical settings of one type or another. Uh, again, Eli Saslow did a great job on um, dental care, <laughs> you know, and people who don't have it and how these, some of these clinics that are set up in really uh, impoverished areas uh, and just the lines of people who haven't received dental care in years. And people don't think about dental care very much until you, you know, your, your mouth is aching uh, and you've got an infection or whatever it might be. So um, I think that, you know, making people aware of the issues, uh, maybe giving people some guidance on where they could go to get more information. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, a lot of reporters, the reporters at the Post, um, some of the best reporting was from within hospitals, just observing uh, what what people were dealing with, because the people in hospitals were superheroes, really. Uh, I mean, they, the challenges that they faced, the risks that they confronted, uh, were immense, and they were dealing with this, um, 
you know, at, at the time, there, weren't, there wasn't enough testing, there weren't enough, uh, um, uh, there just wasn't enough e equipment of various types, and, um, and they were so much at risk, and yet and they were working all the time. Uh, so, um, so it's important that that story be told, so find a way that within an organization, if there's one you're talking about, to get them to see the light, uh, that this is a story that needs to be told and that um, it, will, it will do good. And uh, I think that that's, uh, that's really important, so. I'm going to jump around, but I'm also mindful that I want you to be able to sit again, so. <laughs> okay, as long as you don't put weight on it, it's fine. <laughs> All right, I'll come back to you, though, go up into the balcony. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Ezekiel. I'm a freshman at the college, um, and uh, I'm really interested in what you're talking about with the need to go out there and objectively see what people's lived experiences are in the United States. Um, and actually this summer I'm going to be getting a van with a friend to do just that for about 80 days. Okay. And I was wondering what you know uh, about the potential stories to be found um, and what can be covered uh, in certain, re like if, if you think there's something really interesting that could be covered that really shows uh, that feeling of being left behind that many Americans now face? Uh, I don't know. I haven't really thought it through. Um, you know, I'm not really responsible for news coverage anymore. I, my favorite phrase now is not my problem anymore. Uh, but um, uh, so I haven't really given it a lot of thought. You know, my, what I would suggest is that you not go out with the preconception of actually of what story you're looking for. Rather, go out there, start talking to people uh, and see what they say. I mean, ask people Go somewhere. It doesn't have to be a diner. Don't make it a diner, as a matter of fact. So, uh, uh, and, and ask people about their lives and ask them uh, what their concerns are and what their expectations are and how they feel about how things are going and what are, what are the big concerns in their communities. And I think you will, uh, you think you'd be better off uh, going out there without a preconception of which story you're going to pursue and uh, just talk to people and find out and come up with, that way, you're more likely to come up with something fresh that somebody else hasn't, you know, uh, hasn't already thought of and hasn't already done. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, look, the, the wor many of the worst, I, I shouldn't say this as a former editor, but many of the worst ideas are from an editor who spends all his or his or her time sitting in an office, uh, not getting out there. The best, the best ideas are coming from people who are going to do what you're proposing to do, which is getting out there and talking to people and find out what they're, find out what they're talking about. Hi, um, I'm Liv. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and as Nancy said earlier, I feel like a lot of people have been turned off by possibly like what they see as catastrophi catastrophizing in a 24-hour news cycle that needs to maintain viewership, um, and they look away from the news as something to be avoided. So how do we as journalists and um, people who are within news organizations um, maintain relevance and maintain an audience in the wake of negativity towards journalism? Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting subject of discussion these days, and people like Tom Rosenstiel, who's now a professor at the University of Maryland, and was the head of American Press Institute and a former colleague of mine at the Los Angeles Times. He was a, a reporter, a media reporter, actually. Um, and I think he's, uh, you know, an incredibly insightful guy about our business. Um, he has a pretty good study of the American Press, in, the, the American Press Institute did about uh, the need to write about uh, solutions and how some problems are actually being solved. Uh, so um, I think, you know, what, what turns off a lot of people is that when they look at the newspaper, it's all like things are terrible, this is negative, this is disaster. Uh, but there are people in communities all around the country who are beginning to solve some pretty uh, naughty problems, uh, including, you know, the issue of homelessness. Uh, and so there are some states, some of that's been written, uh, where some states are beginning to come up with some pretty good, pretty good answers to that. And, um, so I think one thing that we can do is try to focus on where things are actually working pretty well and, and make, make that part of the, not that we ignore the things that need to be solved, but that we make that part of our portfolio of coverage. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Russell DeGraff. I'm a Shorenstein Fellow here. I spent the last dozen years with Speaker Pelosi, but I started my career on the FCC's 2003 media ownership debate, so I've followed this for my entire career. Thank you for being one of the few of your peers who understand the flaws of contemporary American journalism. I would like read your, I read your paper in DC, and I would like to clone you in every newsroom. But you asked how we could find out where voters think, and it's probably not random meetups. It's probably intentional conversations like focus groups. And the focus groups that I keep hearing from Republican voters in particular on Sarah Longwell's podcast, The Focus Group, they disbelieve the current Republican Party's views that they, that, you know, they, they just don't believe the, the depravity of today's Republican Party. They didn't believe them even in 2012 about the Romney-Ryan tax plan or the cuts on Social Security or Medicare. It's, it's just kind of crazy that there is a large number of low-information voters who just don't understand where the two parties actually stand on the issues. And I guess my question is, one, why aren't more journalism's, journalism uh, newsrooms launching more focus groups? And is there hope for Jay Rosen's approach for a focus group based model for, journal, for, for newsrooms to start gathering news? And it, it's maybe worth explaining. You could probably do better than I could, but. I haven't, I haven't seen what his uh, proposal is. Um, but I mean, if, if the idea is that uh, we should actually organize our own focus groups, um, and draw story ideas from that. I think like that would be citizens' agenda. I think it would be a great idea. Uh, I think that we don't. I mean, you know, I've sat, I've sat through enough focus groups about you know people's perceptions of news media or product, our product or whatever whatever it is. I mean, more specifically targeted at our subscribers or potential subscribers. And it's I always tell I would always say just send me the report afterwards. I can't bear to stand sitting there watching what people say. I get too depressed. So, uh, uh, so I would recommend that journalists not do what I did, uh, and that is to actually sit through these sessions and listen to what people have to say, because they're incredibly revealing. Um, so, I mean, back in the, before the 2016 election, you know, there were focus groups, uh, not by news organizations, but others that, you know, kind of, tested all the negative stuff about Donald Trump, and none of it stuck. Absolutely none of it stuck with Republican voters. Um, and that was telling, and we should know that, and we should write about that and try to understand why, why it doesn't stick. Uh, but also to understand what people's daily concerns are. I mean, that we really ought to be able to understand about the, what their lives are like. Most people aren't living the news, by the way. Uh, when I was at the Globe, we did a survey of, uh, the, of the public in the Boston metro area, and we did a survey of uh, our own newsroom um, and, and how they read the news and what they're concerned about and how much time they spend on it. These are two different worlds, I can tell you. The, the general public and the people who work in our newsrooms and the way that we think about things, two different worlds. Most people don't live the lives that journalists do, and journalists aren't living the lives of most people, and we need to find a way to bridge that. And having focus groups is a, is, could be a very effective way of approaching that. Sorry, for a short answer for like, why aren't more of you in newsrooms all across the country? What, why are your, your peers not living up to the standards that you have? Living up to the standards that I have? That you set out, yeah. I'm not sure I can answer that question. I'm okay, sorry, That's, nor would I want to. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mia. I'm a sophomore at the college studying English. Thank you for coming. I've been a fan of your work for quite a while, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, I just have a question about, you, you kind of talked earlier about the idea of a free and fair press uh, kind of is directly proportional to the, like current state of democracy. Um, I was wondering with a lot of the commercial interests that you also mentioned with Bezos purchasing um, the Post in 2013 and with Fred Ryan's um, status at the Post as well and now Disney purchased uh, National Geographic and has laid off all of the staff writers. Do you think that the current state of media that is dependent on commercial interests and um, the financial interest that they have in these publications as well allows for a free and fair press, or if it's merely a uh, the, the press morphing into a new, uh, possibly a new role in society that we haven't yet seen. A new what? I'm sorry, what was the last? Or like if the press is morphing into a new role in society that we haven't yet seen, or if no. the current state isn't in fact free and fair as it should be. Well, yeah, free and independent was what I said, yeah. Uh, fair is a good idea too, but uh, free and independent. So, um, I, um, you know, as I said before, I mean, I, there's no 
great ownership model that doesn't have problems to it. I mean, so uh, what I've argued and what I argue in my book is that, um, is that uh, judge us by the work we do, not by the ownership model. So um, with regard to Bezos, uh, yeah, of course, enormously wealthy, you know, depending on the day, wealthiest person in the world, second wealthiest, wealthiest person in the world at the moment. Um, but he never interfered in the, in, in the substance of our journalism. He never did, whether it was about Amazon or anything else. Um, and he took a lot of heat for that. I mean, Trump really went after him as a way of putting pressure on us, and he didn't cave to that pressure. So I give him a lot of credit for that. You can think whatever you want of him and his and Amazon and you know labor practices and privacy issues and uh, whatever. Uh, but. But with regard to what happened at the Post, he gave us our, our, our total independence um, and never interfered, never quashed a story, never uh, suggested a story, never critiqued a story, and um, notwithstanding all the pressure that he came under. So I would say judge us by the work we do uh, and not by the, not by the ownership model. Um, so, uh, and by the way, there aren't that many like billionaires who really want to buy media companies. Um, you know, there's a, a line now, a pretty common joke, like, what do you call a billionaire who bought a newspaper? A millionaire. Uh, so uh, that's the, um, it's not exactly the best way to make money, and most of the people who've made a lot of money, they like to continue to make money. They don't like losing money. So, um, um, and I think people have begun to understand just what a complicated business it is, and that it's not as easy as maybe many, many people imagined. So, um, um, I think we're going to have a lot of different ownership models and different models out there, and I would say judge these media outlets by the work they do. We are nearly out of time. I will give you the final question. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Brandon. I'm a senior at the college, and last year I was the managing editor of The Crimson. Uh, so I just want to say thanks for coming. I really admire all you've done in journalism. Um, I wanted to ask, one of the criticisms that's been leveled at the press a lot over the years is kind of a proclivity for access journalism. I think this really came out, um, especially after the, all the ProPublica reporting on the Supreme Court, people asking, why didn't the Times or the Post get this? And I wanted to ask, I guess, do you see those criticisms as valid? And if so, how can newsrooms kind of counteract these tendencies? Well, uh, I don't think the Supreme Court is a good example of access journalism because they don't give any access to journalists. Uh, so um, so that's, it's not like people were trying to endear themselves to the Supreme Court justices in any, in any particular way. And also the New York Times uh, had done some reporting on Clarence Thomas before ProPublica, although ProPublica, ProPublica did much more work and did fantastic work. So, uh, and really uh, necessary, uh, necessary work. Um, on the broader issue of access, I mean, it's a problem in, throughout journalism. It's always been a problem. It, it is an issue, I should say, throughout journalism. I mean, access to sports figures for sports writers. You know, it's hard to be a sports writer without access to the, the, the you know, the stars. Uh, and, and yet, there are a lot of things to write about in the world of sports that would really piss off some of these stars, um, and including about themselves. Uh, uh, and the same is true in the entertainment industry. Um, obviously, you know, if you get an exclusive interview with a, some celebrity, uh, and that's the magazine cover, well, the magazine's likely to sell more. Um, and, but if you're, if you're being a, a tougher journalist and you're looking behind the scenes uh, in a way that they don't particularly appreciate, well, then they're not going to give you access. And maybe no other star is going to do it because they're going to know that all their public relations people are going to know exactly what kind of journalist you are. And they're saying that's the last person we're letting in the door. So, um, so th and that's been true of politics as well, um, is that people want to have access. It's not quite as true. Um, my view is that we just need to, we, we, we should make sure that access journalism isn't the dominant, <laughs> isn't dominant uh, and doesn't dominate what we do. Um, I mean, I personally didn't, I had somebody the other day saying, I read your book and it surprised me because I thought you just went to Georgetown uh, parties. And I said, I didn't go to any George. I hardly went to Georgetown parties. I just worked all the time. So, um, and, um, and so I didn't seek to become friends with anybody. Uh, and I think there's actually a lot less of that these days. I mean, if you go actually, you know, the 
Ben Bradley was a legendary editor, but my God, I mean, he was, uh, he had tremendous access to the Kennedys and, um, and actually the Graham family was, um, uh, Phil Graham, who was, uh, uh, you know, the husband of Catherine Graham, was, had, had some role, he actually served in government, he actually ran a government agency, and he actually helped hook up, you know, uh, LBJ and, and um, LBJ with Kennedy uh, as, his, as his running mate. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, who can imagine that today? So certainly nobody's asked me my opinion about who should be who's running mate. So, uh, and I haven't offered it. And I'm not even running in those circles to where I would have an opportunity to, and I wouldn't do it if I did. So I think there's actually less access journalism today than there was in the past. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, and I think we should move more in that direction. It's Ellen Hume, former executive director of the Shorenstein Center. Right. I just want to tell you that his book is really good. Uh, thank and you. he's really one of the finest journalists of our generation, and of, I hope all the young people in this room will consider it as a career, even though you'll be targeted and it won't pay you much. It's <laughs> worthwhile. I just wanted to say Thank that. You, Thank Alan. you, Thank you. What a really wonderful nice. way to, 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 to. Thank you, Alan. I did not plan that. I did not. You I haven't seen Ellen in a very long time, so. <laughs> but, but wonderful. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Uh,